we're live. Go ahead. All right. Great. Thank you all for being here. Um, I'm required to read this lovely statement, so I will call the virtual meeting of the Lazard Sands Outdoor Heritage Council order. It is the 11th of January, 2021, uh, uh, 10.03. Uh, the meeting is being held in accordance with a memo dated April 21st, 2020 from the LCC chair and vice chair regarding commission meetings being held remotely. You may have already seen or heard these procedures. However, for those of you who may be unfamiliar with them, members should be muted when not speaking, use raise hand feature if you wish to speak, click lower hand when you're finished speaking. Uh, we will use a roll call vote for everything except the uh, approval of the uh, agenda and minutes. Um, the materials are on the website. Hopefully you've all had a, a chance to review them. And with that, we'll go to the agenda. But before we even get to the agenda, I'd like to welcome our newest member, uh, Scott Dibble. Uh, Senator Scott Dibble, welcome. We're glad to have you part of the group. Um, and Mark, uh, congratulations on your reappointment by the Senate. Um, great to have you both with us. Uh, Thank you, uh, David. Glad to be here. Super. Uh, so the first order of business is to review and approve the agenda. Um, the only comment I will make on the agenda is um, we're going to try, depending on how you feel, uh, to approve all of the requests for appropriation extensions as a package instead of having a presentation from each person saying, this is why I need another six months or a year, because every time we've done it, I found it to be not very informative and, and we've approved every request that's come in. So uh, the the uh, everyone is standing by should you have any specific questions but we're going to try to just approve it as one fell swoop without presentations from everyone um, but that's what's uh, planned on the agenda uh, i will say mark uh, johnson is uh, sick today um, he has the flu i'm told it's not covid but the flu joe may know more but joe is going to fill in for him uh, uh, where he can um, and we hope Mark gets better quickly. Um, but for him to be sick enough to have decided last night he can't attend means he's pretty darn sick. So with that, I would take a motion for approval of the agenda. Oh, I see a request from Jamie Becker-Finn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And just want to give you the heads up. Uh, the, the legislative session has started and I have a committee at 1030. So just wanted to give you that heads up that I will have to log off at 1030. And as long as I'm speaking, I will move the agenda. Okay. Any questions on the agenda? All in favor, signify by raising your hand or saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Ashley, do you have something? Mr. Chair, can oh, I? Oh, you raised that? your hand, sorry. Yes, Scott. My uh, my raise hand feature hasn't been working down in the participant okay. mode, Just so I'm gonna, I can bust in and I have to figure out if there's something wrong with my Zoom app. Anyways, I was gonna mention, um, just like Representative Becker Finn, um, if this goes beyond 11, I'll be multitasking because we go into session. As well. All right. Um, you know, the thing we do need to do is approve the acquisition of parcels with existing and partial state uh, federal ownership. Uh, that's rather important. And we need nine votes to do that. So if it's possible, Joe and, um, and Amanda, can we move that up? Do you think people are ready to make presentations on that quickly? Mr. Chair and members, good morning. This is Joe Hank um, for Mark. So uh, what we were hoping we could do is just go through this um, quickly. And then if there were any questions on specific parcels, the project managers would be here and they should be in the waiting room. Um, okay. Amanda can give us a heads up if they are not, if there are questions. Does anyone have objections if we just move right into that and then come back to the rest of the agenda afterwards. Great, let's do it, Joe, thank you. Okay, 
Perfect, Amanda, if you wanna just give us a thumbs up if people are working their way into the waiting room. Mr. Chair, members, um, we do have some of them in there now. They were told to sign in at 1010. So I would guess that the rest of them should be showing up within the next few minutes, hopefully. Okay, let's just go forward and see what we need. Yep, sounds good, Mr. Chair and members. So uh, we're down to agenda item number seven. And if you remember, well, I guess some of us don't remember, but last time in our December meeting, we were discussing subdivision nine and in subdivision nine, I'll just read it. It says money appropriated from the outdoor heritage fund shall not be used to purchase any land and fee title or a permanent conservation easement. If the land in question is fully or partially owned by the state of Minnesota or a political subdivision of the state, unless number one, the purchase creates additional direct benefit to protect, restore, or enhance the state's wetlands, prairies, forests, or habitat for fish, game, and wildlife. And number two, the purchase is approved by an affirmative vote of at least nine members of the council. Uh, previously, for the last 12 years, uh, what the council has been doing is if there is a portion of the acquisition that is permanently protected, say under a reinvest in Minnesota easement, if the, <clears throat> excuse me, if the project manager <clears throat> has um, other funds or gets the landowner to donate those, uh, the value of that parcel, then they don't need to get approval um, because no OHF money has been spent to acquire those exact acres. And DNR and others have uh, reviewed subdivision nine and believe that that may not be the best way um, to address subdivision nine with those specific parcels with existing protection. So uh, it was a decision was made at the last meeting that all those parcels would come before the council just to make sure we're crossing all the T's and dotting all the I's and making sure we're in line with subdivision nine. And so there's a list, uh, a large spreadsheet with parcels that have existing protection. It's either fish and wildlife, um, wetland easements, habitat easements. There's a couple rim easements, uh, reinvest in Minnesota easements owned by Bowser. Uh, there are some uh, flowage easements, I think owned by the state and even one with the feds. Um, but staff has reviewed all of those parcels and don't believe there's any, anything controversial there. So we uh, put together that list and we're hoping to get approval so that those folks can either close on some of the parcels or move forward with spending money and working out the deals on them. But we don't want to have the uh, project, program managers um, spend time or money on them and then not get reimbursed because they didn't follow the correct procedure. So that's, we're asking for approval of those. And then also remember that uh, the council also recommended that staff work with uh, the bill authors to um, address the issues here with subdivision nine and get that uh, hopefully fixed this session so that we don't have to do this all the time. So are there questions from members? Comments, concerns, Denny. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would uh, move that with uh, Joe's recommendation about staff uh, working with the issues, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Great. Anyone else have any questions? So the motion is to approve the allowance of these parcels because of, uh, despite the fact they have some partial ownership uh, um, as per the, the DNR's current direction to ask us to do that. Um, everyone clear on the motion? Amanda, I guess we'll do a roll call vote. Very good. Begin, we'll begin with number three on our alphabetical list today, um, inserting Senator Dibble as number four. So beginning with number three, Representative Beckerfin. Uh, Beckerfin votes aye. Becker Finn votes aye. Senator Dibble. Dibble votes aye. Dibble votes aye. Eggerling. Aye. Eggerling votes aye. Holston. Aye. Holston votes aye. Senator Lang is absent. McNamara. Aye. McNamara votes aye. Peters. 
Yes. Peters votes aye. Saxhog. Aye. Saxhog votes aye. Swenson. Aye. Swenson votes aye. Hartwell. Aye. Hartwell votes aye. Shara. Aye. Shara votes aye. 10 eyes, one absent. Great. Thank you very much. Um, so we'll go back to the, uh, uh, the agenda. I appreciate everyone's flexibility so we can get that done. Uh, um, and I would just mention, I think Denny, this is probably your last meeting uh, since you're not asked to be reappointed. And I just wanna publicly thank you for all you've done for the council for the years you've been on it, both as a legislator and, and as a citizen. Uh, um, and I know we appreciate it and we appreciate that you showed up today for that vote um, when you didn't have to, but uh, uh, thank you so much for all you've done over the years. You're welcome, Mr. Chair, and thank you for your leadership. Uh, next, we would need a uh, motion to approve the minutes of the last meeting. So moved, Mr. Chair. Any discussion? All in favor, signify by thumbs up or saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, any, I suppose we should have done this first, but any conflicts of interest on today's agenda anyone would like to identify? Great. Um, I've kind of made my comments. Uh, um, I, I will say the, the governor said that he will make his uh, appointment decisions in uh, uh, February. Uh, and uh, um, we don't know when the, the uh, House will make uh, um, its appointments. Uh, we will, as we have, typically uh, wait until all the appointments have been made before we have elections for officers. Um, so whenever uh, we get the word, then we will uh, uh, schedule the uh, election of officers. But uh, otherwise, I don't have any comments, everything's moving along as it should, unless there are questions from anyone. Great, well, Joe, will you give us the executive director's report? Sure, Mr. Chair and members, um, again, welcome Senator Dibble, and again, welcome uh, Mr. Holston, uh, great to have you. Uh, we are waiting on house appointments and the governor appointments are supposed to be scheduled for February. So um, if anyone hears anything, that would be great. Um, Senator Dibble, you should be getting a new member packet from us. And if you haven't got that yet, um, we'll be in contact with you shortly. Um, and then we'll probably try and set meetings up with you whenever you're available. Closed captioning, uh, LCC has advised us that the uh, closed captioning will be available upon archive of uh, video via YouTube, uh, but will not be live unless it's requested from the public ahead of the meeting. And last Friday afternoon, we did have a request uh, come in for closed captioning and we tried to get either internal or external services to um, do it, but neither could make it work because of a short notice. So uh, we did try, but unfortunately couldn't do it. Um, let's see, bill draft. The bill draft is um, being completed right now. We've had the first rough draft from the revisor and we're working on uh, just some final edits and we'll have that to the legislature by the 15th as required. Uh, like someone said, the DNR roundtable is January 22nd. Uh, you should all have received an email by now. If you haven't, reach out to us. Uh, you need to register by the 18th and it's gonna be online. So look for that email. Uh, we do have one other action item that we need to address is the 2021 calendar. Uh, we just need a few adjustments. The December 1st meeting, um, we need to better accommodate the fiscal forecast release for the November 
And if we have it on December 1st, we won't have that fiscal forecast. So we're hoping to move the meeting to December 8th. And then we also have a minor change um, for the program managers uh, in the current draft. It's November 11th is, is when the draft AP deadline is. And we want to move that back to the 15th. We want to give them a few few more days to review or revise their accomplishment plans because we really like our program managers. So those two things we would want to have the council uh, approve is moving the December meeting to December 8th and then moving the November 11th AP deadline to November 15th. And I think typically what we have done is approved a tentative calendar until all the members are selected. Okay. Um, so that we, you know, don't have a, a uh, we don't set a meeting for when a, a new member is unable to attend. That works too. Um, but unless there's an objection uh, uh, from the members at this moment, we'll adopt uh, the tentative calendar for the year. And if you can get that out to everyone, that would be great. Any objections? Great. Jamie, you've got your hand up. Uh, yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, did want to let you know that uh, I was also reappointed by Chair Hansen um, as of Friday, so I will continue to be the uh, House uh, DFL member uh, on, on the council for the next two years. And uh, also, I, I've probably been on Zoom more than most of you in the last week. And when they updated Zoom last time, the raise hand function is now at the bottom if you click on reactions. Um, you can find it there instead of in the participants list. So I uh, wanted to share that hot tip uh, with everyone so they can uh, properly raise their hands. So, um, and thanks again, sorry, I can't stay for the whole meeting. No, but glad to have you back. Uh, thanks for the news. Scott. Just practicing with my new raise hand feet. <laughs> <laughs> I've been trying to find it for like two weeks, so. <laughs> Now you know who to call in the future when you can't figure out Zoom. Great. Anything else, Joe? Or any other, anyone else on the staff? All right. Um, so the next order of business uh, is uh, approve the call for funding request. Mr. Chair and members, this is item number six on our agenda. And it seems like we just did this last year at the same time. Um, we have updated the call. Uh, all of the new dates have been updated. Um, there's been nothing wholesale or major that's been changed. If you remember last year, we did uh, slightly update the scoring system so that all of the uh, scoring categories were all 10 points each instead of all being uh, differently weighted. So that's included in this year's uh, call. And like I said, it's just the dates have been updated. Um, this will be posted on April 1st. And at the end of May, we'll close it down and get you your proposals. So we'll need approval for that so that we can get going on getting the uh, website ready and ready for everybody to apply. So any questions on the, the call? I had one comment or thought, and, and that is, you know, we seem to see requests come in and, and rarely do we fully fund any request. Um, and so, we get a draft accomplishment plan uh, or we get the proposal. And then when we get the accomplishment plan, um, we often see fairly significant swings in percentages uh, of dollars allocated to uh, uh, employment, uh, 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 support services. And I, feel a little bit from time to time like we're seeing a little bit of gaming going on. Uh, um, the overhead numbers stay uh, uh, the same in dollars, but the funding overall goes down or the proportion changes. And I wonder if it would make sense on the, uh, uh, the application 
uh, to actually ask people, so if you got a cut in funding of X percent, um, what would it do to your percent in, in uh, uh, various categories? So that they're committing upfront uh, to what their reductions, uh, what the reductions would mean in terms of, of uh, funding to various categories instead of, well, you got the funding now, tell us how you're going to spend it after we've decided. Um, it would certainly help me and make me feel more confident um, when approving a proposal for, for 40% or 70% to know what the implications are of that in terms of deliverables um, and costs. And I wonder if we could incorporate that into the request uh, somehow on the front end so that we're seeing a commitment up front instead of after the funding is decided. Does that make sense to members and Joe and staff, do you think that makes any sense? Mr. Chair, uh, it does make sense. I think that's something that we could uh, easily do with the uh, online system. We could just add a couple questions in there, a table of some sort, or somehow we'll add something in there so it conveys the uh, information that you're looking for. And I'll uh, ask Sandy if she has any comments that she thinks would be helpful. Uh, we do ask a question. It's on the top of the budget page as to if your program was cut, how, how would you accommodate those cuts? Um, if you would like something more specific, like a table that requires a lot of uh, programming. So we'd have to figure out a time frame to get that done in a cost um, to add, add a different module. Basic questions are easy to add anything that requires tables is a little more complicated. What do you think, I mean, would it cost us $1,000 or $50,000? Oh, it's gonna be five to 10,000 because um, it's, it, it, it's, it's on a per hour charge and then we'd have to do a bunch of testing to make sure that it worked before it went live. Um, a question is pretty easy. Anything like a table is quite a bit more challenging. So I, I just ask the other members, would you find something on this order to be helpful as we're reviewing proposals and accomplishment plans? Or is it just me that gets uncomfortable? Yeah, Ashley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would just say for me, even if I knew how the, the staffing levels would be affected or the DSS would be impacted by a reduction, something like that would be helpful to know beforehand because it seems like that's, that's often the conversation that um, is focused on most whenever we discuss a shift in funding and scaling back um, on different projects. So um, I guess I'd just say that it would, it would be helpful to know ahead of time um, if there is a reduction in funding from what they requested, if they could clarify how that might affect staffing levels. So Mr. Chair, maybe it's just a wordsmithing in the question that we're already asking. Um, do you want a specific number, like a 50% reduction or uh, something to that effect, or is it just getting a little bit more information so that you can feel I, a little bit? I would like it to, this is me, I would like it to have enough information so there are no surprises. You know, Scott? So the question uh, presumes that <clears throat> all the proposals come in with, uh, with the actual number that uh, you know, a, a strongly supported number, you know, the number that, that they actually need to fulfill, fulfill the proposal that's described. Um, are we confident that that's the case with all of these? The reason I ask, of course, is we know that, for example, with the bonding bill or, you know, uh, various other kinds of appropriation requests that come to the legislature, um, everyone knows that they're going to get a haircut in the back room um, out of sight. Um, and so they always inflate 
the, the request at it a little bit, um, but I'm not familiar with. I, I think we, we have exactly the same dynamic. You know, last time through, we saw funding requests versus uh, what was actually received at, at uh, 35 or 40 percent. Um, you know, people would put in very large proposals. And then, of course, you know, we, we are not likely to give someone $15 million uh, um, and still like the proposal and they get 5 million and it's kind of the standard routine. And, and then, uh, um, you know, the, the, the reductions are not the same across the board in terms of outcome and, and staffing and all the rest. And, and what I'm proposing is that we somehow try to get people to commit up front what would a reduction be on some level. Um, because exactly what you're saying is what happens. Tom, you have a comment? Yeah, I, I guess my comment is, is that uh, I, th I think it's worth a shot and I probably thought for a long time that they would be a pretty good idea, but let's keep it simple. So, you know, if you want to make it 50 for everybody and uh, that, you know, I think that would be fine. We're just getting a little feel of, of, uh, of uh, what would happen if they didn't get everything they wanted. Would, would you like it in a table or just a question? And would you like it just one scenario or would you like to see 35 and 60% of requests so that we get a feel for how different levels would affect outcomes? I think that if you're going to keep it simple, you should just have one percentage in there, whether it's 30, probably something like 35 is probably better than 50 because it, it would, it, but, but I don't think you want to get it too complicated and one question should be able to take care of it. So would that question be uh, support services, uh, contracts, uh, I'm, I'm lost on our language, but employees and, and or personnel and, and outcomes? That's you know, everything. That's everything, isn't it? Darn well, me. it isn't material supplies. It, I mean... I mean, these are big, big decisions. We're giving away millions of dollars. Sure. So, um, it seems to me we should know what we're getting before we've made the commitment. And those are the big items that we see. Well, I, I think that I've seen, Mr. Chair, that, uh, that we ought to start out a little more simplistic. And if that doesn't do the job for us, that we can, we, we can become more... Uh, demand more information, but. Okay. So is the council comfortable if, if uh, um, I just work with staff to come up with a question that uh, the, your chair and vice chair work with staff to come up with a question, not a table that we can add that would give some additional clarity as a trial. And if we like what we get, great. Otherwise, we could change it in the following year. I'm seeing some head nods. Does anyone object to that strategy? Great. So with that tweak, um, we need to uh, approve the call for funding. Uh, can I get a motion to approve it with that uh, uh, with the understanding that we will add a question to the uh, application that indicates reduced funding levels and outcomes. So moved, Mr. Chair. Any discussion? All in favor? Uh, or Amanda, you have to take a roll call vote on this. I'm sorry. Mr. Chair, members beginning uh, with number four on our list. Senator Dibble. Uh, Dibble votes aye. Dibble votes aye. Eggerling. Aye. Eggerling votes aye. Holston. Aye. Holston votes aye. Senator Lang is absent. I believe we also just lost member McNamara. P. 
Peters. Yes. Peters votes aye. Saxhog. Aye. Saxhog votes aye. Swenson. Yes, ma'am. Swenson votes aye. Hartwell. Yes. Hartwell votes aye. Shara. Yes. Shara votes aye. Representative Beckerfin is also absent. Eight ayes, zero noes. Motion carries. Thank you all. Uh, we are moving right through this. Uh, um, next on our agenda is a uh, request for appropriation extensions. As I mentioned, uh, you, you saw everything in the packet. Uh, these are fairly routine. Uh, unless you, anybody wants to pull out anyone and, and hear from one of the project managers as to why they want the request and get more information, I would uh, entertain a motion to approve all six of the requests for appropriation extensions. I'll make Scott, that motion. Scott, or Scott raised his hand and then I'll get to you, Kristen. Um, that's fine. If you want to recognize the motion, then I just have a quick question. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, so my, my only question, and it no one really needs to answer it, um, you know, maybe this, um, I'm just so unfamiliar with this, uh, this area, but, um, you know, I noticed a, a, a few of the requests for extension, um, you know, involve, you know, fairly complex projects that uh, would uh, make use of a number of, of different kinds of contractors. Um, so my question is, and, and the projects can't move forward because of COVID or other complications. Um, my question is like, once we get back to, um, or maybe we're never in a state of like normal um, <laughs> production of, of projects, um, but I'm just wondering, um, is it, are we creating, are we gonna create a backlog that uh, in the, in the and I, I assume these are fairly specialized contractors that do this kind of, of restoration um, and, and environmental enhancement work. Um, are we going to create a backlog so that, you know, if things do start to catch up, um, we're just going to have perpetually this this backlog of, of work, or is there is there are there enough folks out there who do this work that that's not an issue? Um, I would love staff to answer that. I think the answer is we don't know. But Joe or Sandy, do you have an opinion on that? Yeah, Mr. Chair and members, um, we fully expect that uh, uh, program managers will get their work done within the time frame that they're allowed, but sometimes things happen. And we usually, you know, there might be one or two uh, extensions maybe at a time, but with COVID, uh, it's an unusual circumstance. So that's, if you looked at um, most of the, uh, agenda items or agenda items, the memos, they uh, talked about COVID and, uh, you know, not being able to meet with landowners and that kind of thing. So it was not a normal circumstance. Um, so usually we won't see this and I don't see a, a backlog um, happening because of it. Um, you know, if, if for some reason the we have another big COVID outbreak and they're not able to keep doing work this coming season, then I could see, you know, more people coming in, asking for extensions, including maybe even the folks that are asking for an extension this time. Um, other reasons for extension, sometimes it's weather. A lot of the habitat work is based on weather. And if we have two wet springs and you're trying to do wetland restoration, you obviously, it's going to be hard to dig in wet ground. So um, there's other issues like that that come up that sometimes folks will need extensions, but this is very out of the ordinary. Yeah, Scott, the other thing you will see when we get to the proposal stage, uh, reports on uh, how many of past appropriations are outstanding and what percentage are outstanding so we can judge whether or not someone asking for more money isn't able to complete the work they currently have money from for, which would influence uh, potentially the giving of them additional dollars and instead see those allocated to people who actually can get the job done. But this is unusual. We've never had requests 
of this magnitude for extensions. Kristen, you had a comment. I was just making the motion. Okay. And then Scott, I saw you were gonna respond. Yeah, I was just gonna say, I'm not, uh, and you know, and I'll I'll ask some, I'll ask some more later. I'm I'm just curious. Um, yeah. I, of course, is concerned about the stuff that just amounts to paperwork. You know, acquiring easements and, and property and the like, um, ne negotiating, um, etc. I'm more concerned about the, you know, in the you know the work that goes on in the ground. Yeah. Um, and whether or not you know we're just going to start creating a cascading effect of more backlogs, or if there is contractor capacity to do this work out there in the real world. I just don't know. I, I think I, yeah. I'm just curious. I mean, I, I, I think we're going to find out because we've never faced this before. Other comments or questions? Great, Amanda, will you call the roll? Denny, you look like you're someplace really warm. We will begin uh, with number five on our alphabetical list this time, Eggerling. Aye. Eggerling votes aye. Holston. Aye. Holston votes aye. Senator Lang is absent. McNamara. I believe you're muted, Denny. <coughs> McNamara votes aye. McNamara votes aye. Peters. Yes. Peters votes aye. Saxhog. Aye. Saxhog votes aye. Swenson. Aye. Swenson votes aye. Hartwell. Aye. Hartwell votes aye. Shara. Aye. With a request that McNamara revolve, er, re, re, reveal his location. I, I don't even know if I'm muted or not, Ron. I'm in Florida. <laughs> <laughs> you dog. Sarah votes aye. Representative Beckerfin is absent. Senator Dibble. Dibble votes aye. Dibble votes aye. Nine ayes, two absent, zero nays. Great. Motion carries. Uh, thank you all. Um, Next is, is uh, a uh, report from the University of Minnesota uh, looking at our outcomes. Uh, Joe, do you wanna introduce this? Uh, Mr. Chair and members, uh, two years. Joe, you're on mute. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Two or three years ago, we had started this process. The council wanted to look into outcomes, not only how many acres we're doing, um, you know, how many prescribed burns we're doing, uh, but actually what that means on the landscape. Um, what does, how does that affect wildlife? How does that affect the plants? ducks or the butterflies? And so um, the first round, what we did is we got a focus group together of project managers and uh, scientists and lots of uh, many more smart people than me. And they looked at all the possible um, outcomes that we could study and what they thought would make sense. And after that process was done, uh, they created a report. And then that report was uh, combined with an RFP and that RFP was uh, sent out and U of M uh, bid on the contract and they were to uh, create a outcomes report and talk about those actual things that um, other than acres and dollars. And so today they are here to present their final report of their study of all of the Lassard Sam's uh, acquisitions. Um, and Ryan Noe and Christina Locker here, and they will, they're both uh, U of M scientists and they will talk about their report. And I think they're going to screen share, and hopefully, Amanda, they are in the uh, waiting room. Hopefully. Mr. Chair, members, they will be in the waiting room momentarily. 
um, they were asked to sign in at 1045 and I did send them an email, but I just got hold of them by phone and they'll be logging in momentarily here. We are running a little ahead, which is good news. So Mr. Chair, the report is up on the website and I believe Ryan will be sharing a PowerPoint presentation as well. And then after the meeting, that PowerPoint will be uploaded. So just since we have a little gap here, Joe, I know there was a public comment um, that was registered, but not in writing uh, verbally. Can you share that with us? Uh, Mr. Chair, that was for the, uh, at the end of the meeting, the public comments. Yeah. Correct. Uh, yeah, so um, the requirements right now for public comment is that they have to uh, let's see, they had to be in by 4 p.m. Friday and they had to be written public comments uh, just because of the Zoom requirements. And there was one person who wanted to make comments but was um, uh, not unable to do it in writing but felt better about doing it uh, with the voice. And so um, that person uh, contacted Amanda and then Amanda um, took down their comments and then Amanda will um, present his uh, comments to us today. And I don't know if we want to do that now or we can do that. Well, I was trying to fill the space between time. So if we're ready to go with the university report, that's great. Otherwise, maybe Amanda can give the report. I'll leave it to you, Amanda. She's, she's obviously busy right now. We, we will do the report later and so much for my attempt at efficiency. Mr. Chair members, I do apologize. I was on the phone with Christina, who's our other U of M presenter. Um, she also missed the email, so she's getting signed in right now, but Ryan is in the room and ready to go. Okay, Ryan, if you can get started, that would be great. Thank you very much for your work and, and your willingness to be in front of us today. Chair, members of the council, thank you for having me. Um, if it would be possible to wait just like a minute for Christina to join. She's got the first half of the presentation, um, unfortunately, uh, but I think she should be joining any minute now. Okay, we will wait patiently. Mr. Chair, members, would you like that public comment while sure. we wait? Go ahead. And, give and I, I do apologize because I did miss a lot of the conversation between you and um, Joe when I was on the phone. Um, but I believe that he backgrounded you that uh, Mr. Rick Heller is the name of the citizen who wished to make public comment and uh, the accommodation was made for him that he could give that comment verbally. Um, if he didn't feel comfortable giving it in writing. Um, and he is an activist and advocate for the um, ADA uh, and accessibility and also um, people with disabilities. So he just wished to draw attention to the fact that the PowerPoint provided by the U of M um, on our website was not in an accessible format. Uh, and along with two other documents that we had posted or not tagged appropriately to indicate that they had come from the DNR for someone who was using a screen reader. Um, and he also just suggested that perhaps the LCC would, he would like to go on record as the LCC, um, suggesting that the LCC perhaps consider uh, instituting a deadline for documents to come into councils in order that they would have time to be remediated for accessibility if they were not um, provided in accessible format. So he would like to be on record as such and uh, also as on record as um, asking that the LCC also check that the YouTube captions provided after the fact do meet the accessibility requirements for the ADA. So that is the extent of his comment. Okay, and can I assume that staff will be in touch with LCC to see what's appropriate? I know the LCC has been working on making things more accessible and we've been We've done what we are required to do. We're being asked to do more and, and we 
con consistently looked at that, uh, but it's really up to LCC to be able to, to enable that to happen. I think that's correct. Is that right? Yeah, Amanda's giving me the thumbs up. So we will pass those comments on unless there are questions from the members. All right, is Christina signing on, Amanda? She yep, is, I see Mr. Her. Chair Member. She's coming into the room right now. Christina, we can see you, not on the screen, but we can see your name and you're muted. Now you're not muted. I'm here. Oh, great. I'm so sorry we ran ahead of schedule and completely ruined your morning, but we appreciate your <laughs> flexibility. That's okay. I, I didn't think that was quite a possibility to be an hour and a head, but uh, we'll make it work. <laughs> we all love Zoom so much. Um, Ryan indicated you have the first half of the presentation, so we've kind of done the intro. So if you can just launch right into your presentation, that would be great. Sure. Ryan, are you going to share your screen or do you want me to share the slides on my screen? Uh, I can share. I have them pulled up. Okay, great. That's the wrong screen. You were on screen and then it went away, Ryan. Yeah. Bad. There, that looks good. Thank you. All right. Okay. Um, I don't know how many introductions or how, how in-depth you got into that, but I'll just start by saying thank you for having us. I am Christina Locke, um, and along with Ryan, we are from the Keeler Lab at the University of Minnesota. Um, we've been working on an OHF outcomes report um, and last presented preliminary results to you one year ago, which is kind of nuts that this year has flown by, um, but we're happy to report that now we have a finished product. And I'll acknowledge our collaborators on this project, including a long list of researchers from the Natural Resource Research Institute in Duluth, as well as Eric Lonsdorf, uh, Lonsdorf at the Institute on the Environment at the U. And they were really instrumental in compiling or creating from scratch most of the wildlife habitat metrics we present in the report. Um, also a big thank you to Mark Johnson and Joe Pavalka who made this project possible and provided helpful guidance along the way. Okay, so we'll dive in and start with a reminder of the goal of this report. Um, the purpose of this project is to assess outcomes of OHF fee and easement investments acquired in the first 10 years or so of the program. And it's easy enough to tally up acres acquired and dollars spent on these investments, but this report is designed to go beyond those metrics um, because habitat conservation affects all kinds of things and counting up the acres in the OHF portfolio does not tell us much about what kind of benefits um, that land is providing to species and to people. Okay. So there are many places we could start um, uh, to define to define outcomes. Um, and fortunately for us, the working group, group who contributed to this 2017 report provided a very helpful blueprint for doing that. This report recommends a suite of indicators that could help demonstrate public benefit mm -hmm. of the OHF portfolio and accountability for um, the OH, OHF portfolio, um, letting people know where their tax dollars are going. And rather than evaluate the success of individual OHF projects, um, it looks at, again, the OHF portfolio as a whole, which is the same approach we took in our report. Next slide, Brian. thanks. Uh, so this 2017 report 
um, recommended pursuing indicators directed at the constitutional directive of OHF and emphasized fish habitat, wildlife and game habitat, and outdoor recreation opportunities. The working group also included a fourth category um, of outcome focusing on other economic, social, and ecological benefits of the fund. We made an effort to capture as many recommended indicators as possible um, in these four categories and along with our collaborators ended up with a list of 21 metrics we analyzed for the report. And I'll go through each of these categories quickly. Um, the full list is in the report, full definitions of each metric are in the report. Um, but for fish habitat, we captured unique species uh, presence with a metric called lakes of biological significance, which is a metric from DNR that scores water bodies based on um, aquatic species communities, presence of unique species. We also included data on, on trout streams. So if land is near trout streams or within the ca uh, catchment of one of these lakes of biological significance, that land would score higher. For wildlife habitat, we included data on non-game and game species habitat. Non-game habitat, uh, we had categories for birds and mammals of greatest conservation need in Minnesota. And for game species, we included upland birds, waterfowl, fur bearers, and deer habitat. For species riches, we had a metric for bird species riches. We have a lot of, we have a lot of data on birds compared to other um, groups of animals. So we use bird species uh, richness from the Minnesota Breeding Bird Atlas is where that data comes from. We captured the risk of habitat loss with two metrics, one for the risk of land conversion to developed uses and one for the risk of land conversion to agricultural uses. Our outdoor recreation metrics included, oh my gosh, uh, wild rice sites, bird watching data from eBird, so actual data of people going out and, and looking at birds, um, lake recreation based on lake clarity, public accessibility, and lake visitation. We had a metric for the proximity to public trails and the size of nearby human population as an indicator of accessibility. For that fourth category of benefits to other, uh, other benefits to people, the 2017 report names wellhead protection as a priority. And so we included a metric capturing the vulnerability of land included in drinking water management supply areas. And that is a metric defined by the Minnesota Department of, of Health. So these 21 metrics measure very different things. So we standardized them by scaling them all from zero to one, where zero is lowest quality and one is highest quality. Many of the figures in the report refer to high quality or highest quality land. Um, so to define those categories, a land parcel scored high if it scored in the top half of parcels statewide for a given metric and low if it scored in the bottom half and a parcel scored highest if it scored in the top quarter, quarter of parcels statewide. So the next slide shows an example of how this scoring works kind of visually um, for just one of the metrics, upland game bird habitat. So that is a metric um, from the Minnesota Breeding Bird Atlas, which models habitat for three species, woodcock, uh, turkey, and grouse. And um, after rescaling the habitat scores on the scale from zero to one, we we're able to categorize land across the state into the quality categories based on how the scores compared to the scores of the rest of land in the state. So we're able to make maps like this with colors showing um, low quality habitat, maybe moderate, um, high and high quality habitat. So we did that for each of the metrics and we're able to um, complete the rest of the analyses in the report um, based on those scores. So the, uh, we did three main analyses in the report. The first one is scoring the entire OHF portfolio on each of the 21 metrics. The second is scoring OHF parcels based on overlapping multiple benefits. So not just taking each metric separately, but looking at where they overlap. The third is putting OHF investments in context by comparing the benefits of OHF investments um, to other conservation programs, in particular, uh, the WMA program. So these are three different ways to provide meaningful comparisons for interpreting the scores of OH OHF lands. 
um, because a score doesn't mean much on its own. I can tell you the OHF portfolio on average scored, uh, I don't know, a 0.8 on one metric, but what does that mean? Is that high or low? So we need meaningful comparisons to put the scores in context. So we did that in three different ways. And I'll go through the first analysis now. So for the first analysis, we used matching methods to compare OHF parcels to similar non-OHF parcels. So when I talk about matching, I mean we compared the scores of OH parcels, OHF parcels to non-OHF parcels that were very similar. So they were in the same region of the state. They were similar in size, shape, and land value. So matching is one way to minimize bias that results from comparing two very dissimilar groups. So in other words, comparing OHF parcels to matched parcels is a fairer way to compare than if we compared OHF parcels to dissimilar land that is unlikely to ever be considered for OHF protection. So this, the matched, the, the land in green on that map um, represents land that could potentially be acquired um, at some point for uh, under the OHF program. So that's the land we compared um, the, the OHF scores to. So the results of that um, are shown in this graph um, and the OHF portfolio scored, scored highly. You should feel very good about um, it performing, uh, the scoring highly on a lot of the metrics that kind of directly relate to the constitutional mandate. Um, so habitat metrics, including deer habitat, pollinators, upland game birds, forest birds, and waterfowl in particular, also scored highly on land that was near trout streams and, and pheasant habitat as well. Um, interestingly, OHF scored highly on waterfowl game bird habitat, but low on wetland bird species of greatest conservation need. And that's interesting because both of those metrics are very um, related to uh, wetland habitat. So waterfowl, game birds scored highly, species of greatest conservation need that rely on, on wetlands, not highly. Um, so it may be that the OHF portfolio provides great habitat for the more common game species. Mallards are in there, Canada geese, mergansers, um, blue winged teal, that, that sort of thing. Um, but it could be that the, the, uh, the wetlands um, on those lands is not serving the less common species, including bittern, um, black tern, sage wren, and yellow-headed blackbird. So that was one interesting finding of the habitat metrics. Um, the, or, the OHF portfolio scored lower on um, our accessibility and habitat loss risk metrics. Um, so that means the land protected by OHF tends to be further from nearby population and less at risk of habitat loss than similar non-OHF lands. Interestingly, we see that OHF lands provide really good bird habitat for a lot of species and are open to the public, but they are less often used for bird watching than similar non-OHF lands. That means that bird watchers are choosing lands other than OHF lands for some reason for their bird watching needs. So those are a couple um, of the things that stood out from that analysis. And Ryan will continue with the other two analyses. Thank you, Christina. Uh, so Christina has told us about how the portfolio performed on individual metrics and how well those uh, metrics were represented within the, in the portfolio. But I wanna shift gears for a second here and talk about multiple benefits um, and uh, stop looking at just individual metrics and look at where are there multiple metrics that scored highly found together? Uh, so this is, I gotta preface this by saying that this is just one of many useful strategies for conservation. Uh, we can't do, you know, all multiple benefits all the time everywhere because that's just not possible. Uh, some benefits are mutually exclusive. So it makes sense to have a portfolio where you have some parcels that are just really good at one particular thing. Um, but one way to complement that where you're getting more bang for your buck is to also target land where you're getting multiple benefits on the same parcel. Things like deer habitat and pollinator and upland game, game birds um, all in one place. Uh, and the other really cool thing about multiple benefits is that they're really an opportunity for collaboration with other organizations, um, which is how you can 
uh, address some of the metrics that are outside of the constitutional mandate. Uh, so for example, something like pheasant habitat can be really compatible with uh, protecting uh, uh, drinking water supplies uh, in wellhead protection areas. Uh, so although um, wellhead protection isn't within the, the OHF's constitutional mandate, uh, it, by targeting land with multiple benefits, you can uh, create collaborations with organizations like the NDH, and you can bring in more resources and more public benefits um, with a single acquisition. So the way we set out to analyze multiple benefits is by creating the map shown on the right here. Uh, and the way we did that was we classified all 21 of the metrics that Christina mentioned earlier into one of two categories. Either they were the highest quality class for that particular metric or they weren't. And for most metrics, we define the highest quality class as the top 25%. Um, with some of the categorical metrics, there were other definitions used. We can talk about that later. It's also in the appendix of the report. Um, but once we had these 21 maps with just you know, zeros and ones, uh, we added them together and we came up with this map here, uh, which is the sum of all of those highest quality class benefits found on a single piece of land. Uh, so for most of the state, you're looking at one to three of these high, highest quality class benefits found in one place. Um, but in some areas, there were up to 16 uh, of, of these um, benefits, the top 25% found on a single piece of land. Um, so now that we had this data to analyze it, the next question we had was, how did the OHF portfolio perform um, with regards to multiple benefits? Did it preferentially target them uh, or did it look more like uh, it was the, the statewide average as a whole? So. The way, we, the way we tested this is that we looked at the OHF land and we found the distribution uh, of the number of benefits found on each of those parcels. And that's plotted here on the orange bars. And to compare, uh, we, for our counterfactual, for our comparison set on that, we used uh, the, all of the unprotected non-urban land in the state. And we scored that uh, on, those, on those same benefits. And those are the purple bars there. So if there was no preference shown for multiple benefits in, in the OHF acquisitions, we would expect the, the distribution of those orange bars and those purple bars to look the same. Uh, but that's not what we see. We see that the orange bars are shifted more to the right, which is where there's more multiple benefits, um, indicating that the OHF portfolio was preferentially, at least a little bit, targeting multiple benefits in its acquisitions. Uh, and that's backed up by the fact that 98% of OHF acquisitions scored in the highest quality class on at least two of the metrics, um, but really more often four or five or six of them. Um, another thing that we found while we were doing this analysis is that while it's rare, some land scored really highly on 12 or more metrics. And of this land, 93% of it is unprotected by any conservation program um, at all. So that represents a big opportunity, I think, for multiple benefit um, targeting in the future. Uh, so the last way that we analyze these data that we want to show um, is what did the OHF acquisitions add to existing conservation programs in the state? Uh, so we've, we've tossed around a lot of numbers, about tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of acres. Um, but that really, I think, it's hard to interpret for an average person. Um, so the way we wanted to provide some context for those is to plot it alongside a well-known conservation program. So we chose the WMA program because of the similar goals uh, that, that it has and its established history in the state. So uh, without OHF acquisitions, the WMA portfolio is around 1.3 million acres. And we wanted to know in just, and, and that's been, and that's over, I think, 50 or 60 or more years. Uh, so we wanted to know in the last 10 years, what has, what have OHF acquisitions added to that, um, to, that for, to the conservation portfolio in the state on top of WMA acquisitions? Uh, so the important thing to note here is we're not making any kind of judgments about uh, the WMA program versus OHF. Uh, in fact, really, we're trying to point out how complement, uh, the complementarity of the, of the two programs for providing benefits uh, to conservation portfolios of Minnesota. Um, 
So we don't have time to go through all 21 of the metrics that we analyzed. All um, this a version of this figure for each of those metrics is in the report. I'm just gonna cover three of them here really quickly. And the first one is uh, pollinator habitat quality. Uh, this is one where uh, OHF acquisitions in the last 10 years have more than doubled the area in uh, the protected area of the highest quality class. That's the upper, you know, upper quartile of quality. Uh, and a lot of that came from the, the blend and easement. Uh, so you can see on this graph, the, the blue bars represent WMAs. And then on top of that, uh, the orange bars are OHF uh, acquisitions. And because the blend and, um, blend and easement had such a huge share of your portfolio, we, um, after feedback from Mike Kilber, we decided to plot it separately so that we could see what, uh, what influence it was having on each of these metrics. Um, but uh, all taken all together, the uh, OHF acquisitions added protection for over 200,000 acres of the very high quality class of pollinator habitat. Turning now to mammal species of greatest conservation need. Um, again, the, the OHF acquisitions added over 200,000 acres of high or very high mammal of mammals of species, mammal species of greatest conservation need habitat. Um, and this one, the, uh, the blended easement is again uh, dominant, but this time in the high uh, category class and in the very high category class, uh, the non blended acquisitions were the larger share of, of OHF land in that class. And then last, I wanted to highlight uh, pheasant habitat. Um, and I chose this one because uh, since have pheasant, the pheasant range is in the southern half of the state, the blinded easement doesn't show up in here at all. Um, but despite that, over 40,000 acres of high or very high quality pheasant habitat were added to the OHF portfolio. Uh, and of the land in the pheasant habitat range, the more, majority of the acquisitions were in the very high quality class. So I just want to uh, note a few uh, future directions for data collection and management that uh, came, um, recommendations that came out of this report. Uh, the first is we just wanted to flag some data quality limitations with the uh, existing data uh, that would be of interest to future researchers. Um, and one of those is that the cost variables were inconsistently used in the data set. So there was an estimated cost variable that was fairly consistent for all of the land. And that's the one that we ended up using for our analysis. Uh, but the breakdown of purchase price and donated value and closing costs and things like that was less consistently reported. I think um, about 10% of, of land had, uh, had a zero for the purchase price, but that was also not flagged as a donated um, easement. So that was just something that complicated our analysis. We were able to work around it, um, but it's something to keep in mind when uh, looking at these, at these data in the future. And uh, I think that most of these issues were from acquisitions were, that were earlier on in the, in the history of the program that the data quality has gotten better as time has gone, have, has gone on. Um, but another issue was that uh, multiple overlapping boundaries for, for uh, projects were often listed. Um, so sometimes it was just the same shape over and over and over again. And if you were to go in and you were to sum up the amount of area in a given, given region, you could end up doing a lot of double counting, double counting if you weren't aware of that and you didn't uh, eliminate that before you did, did that analysis. So that's just something that um, I don't think should be in there. I don't, I don't know why you'd have multiple overlapping boundaries for, for a given acquisition. Uh, and then finally, uh, the, the identifiers that were linking boundary records um, to the, the tabular data weren't always unique. And then this complicated finding those um, multiple overlapping boundaries because sometimes you have multiple non-unique uh, identifiers that went to uh, different parcels and then sometimes they went to one overlapping parcel. But these are all um, relatively minor, uh, like less than 10% of the data that uh, we just, um, we worked around, but we wanted to flag as, as an issue that was in there. Uh, and then finally, as for uh, where this research fits and 
um, where it could go in the future. I just wanted to kind of plant it on this spectrum um, where we had the, uh, on the left there, we have the old status, which is, you know, acres and dollars. This is what we, we started off with before this report. It's readily accessible, it's easy to communicate. Um, but this report adds sort of this environmental benefits database approach where we have data on the quantity and quality of about 21 different metrics. Um, and you can get with that, you can get a real dashboard view of the portfolio benefits that are provided uh, by the OHF. Um, and another advantage of this report is that it's, you know, it's the foundation for a repeatable report card uh, where you could in the future, um, when there's new acquisitions, just plug in a new layer with uh, those new acquisitions and generate these same figures to see how the portfolio's um, benefits are changing over time. Um, but a limitation of this uh, analysis is that it isn't able to capture you know, these real on the ground changes that are um, particularly associated with restoration and enhancement activities which I know make up a big, far, uh, a big uh, portion of the OHF um, expenditures, uh, but we didn't include in this report because we don't really have the ability to say much about what uh, is happening when we're using these statewide um, remotely sensed data sets. To get at the changes and really do um, attribution to OHF from, from those restoration enhancement activities, you really should complement a, a report like this with individual parcel case studies uh, where you can go out into the field and do data collection and then repeat the same measurements over time. So you can see what the status was before the activity and then what it was in the years after the activity. Um, so that, that is, I think, would really complement some, some of the areas of this report. So Ryan, uh, did if I can interrupt, did you take into account that we do do restoration evaluations? I'm, I'm glad you said that because that was I had that in my notes and I forgot to mention it. Um, yes, we we uh, we looked at your your technical review evaluations and think that that is a really great program. Um, the one the one uh, note I would have is that it didn't appear that they were looking at a repeated measure over time, um, which would really help with some of the attribution of, of benefits. So uh, in summary, I'm just gonna highlight um, four of the, the take-home points from this report. Uh, when looking at portfolio representation, OHF parcels scored really highly on habitat metrics for deer, pollinators, upland game birds, four species of various conservation need, trout and pheasant. And when looking at it from a multiple benefits perspective, 70% uh, of the OHF land scored highly on three, four, and five co-benefits uh, co compared to only 50% of non-land, not urban, unprotected land, um, showing that there is a preference for uh, multiple benefits. Uh, I should note, however, though, that there are still a lot, there's still a lot of unprotected land out there that scored really highly on 12 or more multiple, on uh, 12 or more benefits. Uh, looking at the added conservation value, uh, OHF increased the protected area of the highest quality habitat for game mammals, uh, upland game birds, and forest uh, birds of bird species of greatest conservation need by approximately 75%, and more than double the protected area of the highest quality pollinator habitat compared to WMAs. And then finally, for future directions, uh, I think that this report shows that the, the methods that were developed here can be repeated as the OHF portfolio grows and it can be used to provide a statewide update on the amount and type of benefits added to the portfolio. So with that, I will open it up to questions. Great, thank you very much. Uh, I, I would just add a comment that this work is showing benefits in excess of what it is that we are uh, charged to do with our constitutional dedication. So this is the, the plus game. It is not anything that's a negative that we could have done better on is not really a negative um, because we are, you know, I, I think uh, the work that we're doing 
is appropriate for what the money has been approved for. And, and this is really a look at what other benefits might there be beyond what uh, we're supposed to be doing. Um, so no one should feel like, geez, we didn't, hold, we didn't score high on this. We're really not doing a good job. And Ryan and Christina, please confirm that for us. I can confirm that. that yeah, that's an accurate interpretation. Okay, great. Other comments, questions? Joe, do you have anything? No, I see Scott, you've got. Sorry, not, not quick enough on the raise hand draw there. Uh, <laughs> In that new place. It's, it's such a great venue, this Zoom. Right. Um, so I appreciate it. I'm, it, I'm kind of glad I, uh, I got to jump in um, at this point to, to be able to see this report uh, given. I just reviewed it uh, for the first time just prior to this meeting and appreciated the, the presentation of it. Um, so I, I, you know, it, it sounds great. Um, I feel like there's there's more there though to be interpreted, um, and wondering if there might be some opportunity either with with our uh, chief investigators or or someone else um, to help dive a little deeper and understand it better. Even though it looks great, I, I'm curious, of course, more on you know what what does it show us that we could do better, even though we're surpassing, as you said, Chair, um, you know what the minimal amount that we're required to do. Does it point us to some spots in which we could do better um, to, to carry out our mandate or to serve you know, the interests of the public and, and in our environment better? Um, I'm wondering, for example, about, you know, it looks like we're doing great on game birds, but what about non-game birds? We're doing great for hunters, but what about bird watchers? Those sorts of things. So, so the question is, there will be the opportunity to maybe offline, um, do a deeper dive so that I can help, you know, I can understand this report better. Yeah, I, I think we can certainly put together a, a, a meeting for members, uh, either a public meeting if lots of people want to participate or, or uh, just a private offline meeting if, if there's less than a quorum that wants to participate. Uh, um, to dive as deep as you want. And, and staff is certainly happy to facilitate that. And Joe, I'd put that on your list of you know, follow-up. Perfect, Mr. Chair. Can I add a comment? Certainly. Uh, Mr. Chair, one thing that I think about, so, um, you know, I, I look at this report as pretty positive, but then, in addition to this report, you know, you review all of the annual uh, reports that the DNR does on the restoration and enhancements. And then also just actually going out um, and seeing the parcels, you know, all the tours that the council has had uh, going to different parcels and then just personally going out, you know, hunting or bird watching or doing whatever uh, throughout the state uh, on all these parcels and you know, knowing what I've seen, I feel you know pretty good that we've done um, you know a really good job. I've never been to a site where I thought, "Gosh, this is this doesn't make any sense." What were these guys thinking? It's always been you know really nice, and you know the restorations have been good. And you know, I, I like visiting sites that are under process and sites that are finished. And it uh, it just seems like we're we're on the right path. So. Hopefully, the next 12 years will be just as good or better. Other comments? Tom? <clears throat> well, uh, being right next to the, uh, to the bland and easement, you know, I feel like that uh, it's important to note that uh, in northeastern Minnesota, which has so much public land, that, uh, that, that our organization uh, has done an excellent job of, of uh, uh, acquiring or preserving an easement, whether it be Blannon or Potlatch or, or whatever, pieces of land which, uh, uh, which 
if 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 we hadn't done this, would probably continue in the last 12 years. Land and huge chunks would have been fragmented. I, I have no doubt about that. So uh, we we note that uh, and and in answer to Scott in the in, <clears throat> in the example of Bland, we see it's not only deer and, and upland game birds, but songbirds and uh, and uh, if we're, if we're concerned about wolves, there's lots of wolves in the, in the territory too. So um, I, 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 think, I think those were great acquisitions. And if you look at the amount of money that it took, because it, it, it took so, so little management, just the acquisition, um, I, think we, I think we find that that was a, a, a great move over the years. Other comments, questions? If not, Christina and Ryan, th oh, Scott, you've got another. Just, just wanna, I know this is outside of um, the scope and purview of this committee, um, but I am curious, it's just kind of a question I'll pose to the committee and the wider world. Um, you know, so, so we've got these great results, um, but it'd be important to understand um, if we're just uh, scrambling to stay ahead of, you know, significant changes on the landscape attributable to, to climate change. Um, you know, and maybe that's more of a question for our strategic direction going forward. Um, you know, a lot of what we're doing is gonna be made moot uh, by changes that are that are going to occur, even if we succeed in bringing our carbon footprint down, we know that the temperature is going to go up. And there's going to be substantial uh, changes in our environment and our in our um, biological zones uh, throughout the state. And uh, just wondering if if this kind of research uh, can inform that, or you know, if if we need to start thinking about and taking a look at that, and or do we have a role in in uh, resiliency activities. I think the, the answer is we don't have a required role, but it could be an additional benefit we could be looking at um, when we're doing projects. Um, and we up to this point have not used that as a consideration somehow. And would have to do some work to think through uh, with that as, as well as the other multiple benefits, how we would get to that information as we're making decisions versus looking at how we've done after the fact, which is a great discussion to have. Yeah, well, let's, let's try to put a pin in it because I think it could be read into our, our, our mission and our, and our scope and protecting for wildlife and, and a habitat that supports wildlife if we're not um, anticipating the, the consequence and effect on climate change, then we're not actually doing that job. Yep. So Joe, I'll leave it to you to make a note for further consideration. Thank you, Scott. Other comments? Great, well, Ryan and Christina, thank you for joining us this morning. We appreciate your work and the information. Thank you for having us. Yep. Yeah. With that, members, I think we've worked our way through the agenda. And I'm giving you back almost an hour of your day, if that's all right with you, unless someone has something they'd like to say. And Denny, enjoy Florida. Um, you've got your hand up, so. Mr. Chair, it's been an honor to serve with all the members, and especially I want to thank the staff and Joe and Sandy and Amanda put forward on to Mark. It's been an honor to work with them. They're just terrific state public servants. So thank you all. Enjoy your time. I'm going to enjoy Southern uh, Florida some more. So goodbye. <laughs> all right, Danny. Thanks. And thanks to everyone. Stay safe. Stay warm. Uh, enjoy yourselves. Mr. Chair, I think I think Member Saxog might be waving his hand at you. Oh, sorry, Tom. I was waving goodbye to Danny. 
<laughs> and he's gone. So there you go. <laughs> all right. Thanks all. We'll we'll talk uh, at our next opportunity.